conservative or otherwise, you get to air your point of view. We are an independent media outlet that unlike mainstream media beholden to corporations, we only owe allegiance to you. Remember, you can also send me a tweet at E-G-B-E-R-T-O-W-I-L-L-I-E-S. That is at Egberto Willies. Let us engage. It is politics done right. Well, folks, welcome to one more edition of Politics and Radomic. Berto is your host. Thank you so kind of being a part of the show. We are going to have a great show for you today. Actually, a very good show because a, the star of the show today is going to be a Gen Z young lady, former president of the University of Houston's uh, class, uh, University of Houston student body. And she is going to have quite a bit to say, very, very much in the game. And we can only hope that others like her join the fold. Not join the fold, but extend the fold, because she is in the fold. Anyway, I'm on my third day of fasting, and it finally hit very hard today. I um, I have about, let's see, what time is it? It's 3.07 in uh, Texas. I have about four hours and... 53 more minutes to go before I can put something in my mouth to eat. I am starving. I am weak and I'm still doing my spinning. And I spun this morning, but I had little energy to spin, but I did it. I did it. I did it. Have to make sure, folks, I don't like doctors, so I'm trying to keep myself. What can I say? At least partially in shape. But. I'm not in ketosis. I don't think, well, I don't think I'm in ketosis yet. You have to be burning fat, right? Well, I guess I am. Maybe I am. I don't know. I just checked the, did the breath test to see if I smell the ketos. Anyway, welcome aboard. Eric Hayes, welcome aboard AVQ. From, all right, let's start the right way. Eric Hayes from Atascacita Kingwood. Uh, AVQ, uh, El Senor Rudden from, Michael Rudden from, Brooklyn, New York. We have Melanie Keelan from Barcelona, Spain. We have E2247 from all over. We get, of course, Yvette Avery Herod, our beauty from Atlanta, Georgia, the union activist. I usually say specialist, but she's not only a specialist, she's also an activist. And of course, Michael Rudden is in the house. And more, where are all my people? Where are all my people? We are still kind of low on our people. Even Twitter is missing. Even Twitter is uh, is not there. Didn't you like the topic, guys? You know, let me tell you what happens a lot of time. If I have Israel or or any kind of stuff that sort of particular keywords, the notifications seem to go like that. I don't know why, but yeah, we know why. We, we don't we? We 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 definitely know why. We definitely know why. But folks, that's okay. We are all in this posse together. And we're all going to see these numbers start to grow. Come on, guys. Come on. Come on. Come on. Anyhow, uh, let's see. Melanie Keelan says it sounds exciting. I promise you that. Mel- uh, E2247 says I'd be trapping cicadas and bringing home the meat for my turtles. So do you shell the cicadas uh, to give to your turtles or you give it to them with the shell and everything on? Because I think they have an exoskeleton, right? Which makes it kind of hard to eat. Uh, look at that. I had a hard time finding you at 3 p.m. You see, there we go. That's what I'm talking about. Let me tell you, I made a mistake and started the, um, with the, I didn't correct the, or change last, uh, yesterday's topic. So I had to rush and do that. And so I had to start twice. That's maybe part of the problem that you have finding it. I probably should delete that other one that, that got started accidentally. If I can, maybe I can, maybe I can't. We'll see if it allows me to delete it. I am going to try as we speak to delete it. Let's see if I can delete it. Uh, Unfollow, save. Oh, wow. It doesn't allow me to delete. Why is it being so crummy and not allowing me to delete? Let's see if there's another place I can go to delete it. You know, I'm not sure I like the way it works on it doesn't even have a way to hide it. Come on. So that people don't get confused. That's what we want to do. Uh, nothing there. Nothing there. Let's see if there's something elsewhere. 
Not, oh, hide? No, that's a different hide. Let's see. All right. I'm going to start with the program in a minute, folks. As I speak, I hope more people would join as I try to clean up some of the mess I created. Uh, para ver si me, hace, si me hace romperlo ahora. Parece que no lo puedo hacer. Parece que no lo puedo hacer. Manage post, maybe. Let's see if that allows me to do it. Ah, I think I found a way that I will be able to do it. I have to go into manage post and then say uh, delete post. Ah, that. let's hope I don't delete the wrong one, but I just did. I permanently delete it. Now nobody should have a problem in finding today's show from a duplicate. Bruce Pollard is in the house. He said, uh, good day. Oh, man, he must be speaking the talk from the Midwest. Likewise, in the house, uh, let's see what else we get. What else we get? Okay, good. Let me start reading what you guys have out there. Michael Radden says, World Socialist Website. Claudia Sheinbaum, AMLO's protege, elected president of Mexico. The Morena Party of Mexico's president, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, known as AMLO, won a resounding victory on Sunday's general election with its results described as a landslide. They got like 58% of the vote or tsunami in the corporate media. Predictably, the corporate media in Mexico and internationally has focused in commentary on Mexico's election of its first female president, suggesting fraudulently that this milestone will somehow open the door to a more democratic and socially cons uh, conscientious form of capitalist rule. The result expressed a persistent popular hatred for the right-wing record of austerity, corruption, repression, and subservience to U.S. imperialism associated with AMLO's predecessors. Masses of workers and youth seek a radical expansion of the limited social programs initiated under Morena, which consisted of cash transfer for pensioners, students, and small farmers, and more than doubling the minimum wage. Lopez Obrador saw a major spike in his popularity in recent weeks. You know, they're trying to tag him Wait, with the recent weeks Rating of up to 80%, according to the pollsters in Gallup. 80% favorability rating. That's what a good progressive does for you. Imagine if Biden decided to have been a real big progressive like AMLO was. AMLO gave those news, long news programs. He kept people informed. I listened to some of them in Spanish, right? He go and, and sometimes you have the Spanish reporters from the United States really try to hit him up. They were trying to hit him up on crime and all of that. And he looked at one of the reporters and said, you know where all those guns that's killing our our people come from? The United States. Here's the funny thing. We want we want to invade Mexico because of the the crisis of uh the drugs that that come over here from Mexico, right? Which by the way, most of them don't really come over the border from Mexico. They come through the air, they come through sub, they come all through all kinds of avenues. But the the um that epidemic that we're having now, what is it called? The not quaaludes, but what do they call them? You know what I'm talking about. That epidemic, we like to, oh, Mexico is getting a lot of our people killed. Mexico is getting our people killed. Guess what's getting Mexicans killed? Our guns. We are exporting a ton load of gun to, the, to Mexico, both legally and illegally. And all those Mexicans that are dead from all these metralladores, the machine guns, etc. The opioid crisis is what I'm talking about. And all of that. What do you think? Think about it. Suppose Mexico said the same thing. We're going to hold America accountable for having all those guns come over to Mexico. Sometimes when you try to be fair, it can be a bitch, can it? All right. Associated Press from Michael Rodden again. A scientist, a leftist, and a former Mexico city mayor. Who is Claudia Shamboin? Claudia Shamboin, who will be Mexico's first woman leader in the nation's more than 200 years of independence, captured the presidency by promising continuity. The 61-year-old former Mexico City mayor uh, and lifelong leftist ran a disciplined campaign. Hear what you hear? What they say? She ran a disciplined. I need to check something here. She ran a disciplined campaign. Not only a disciplined campaign, uh, capital, uh, campaign capitalizing on her predecessor's popularity before emerging victorious 
in Sunday's vote, according to an official quick count. But with her victory now in hand, Mexicans will look to uh, how, see how Shamboin, a very different personality from mentor and current uh, per Andres Manuel Lopo Lopez Obrador, will assert herself. While she hewed close to Lopez Obrador politically and shares many of his ideas about the government's role in addressing inequality, she is viewed as less combative and more data-driven. Shineboyne has repeatedly praised Lopez Obrador and thus far said little that the president hasn't said himself. She blamed neoliberal economic policies for condemning millions to poverty, promised a strong welfare state, and praised Mexico's large state-owned oil company, Pemex, with also promising to emphasize clean energy. It is amazing how it is not difficult to do the numbers and show that the neoliberal estate, the capitalism as practiced, is a distinct failure. And mathematically, it is doing exactly what it is supposed to do. And why the fascists are coming into power uh, or trying to come into power, why the billionaires are supporting the likes of fascists, is because democracy doesn't work when you pill for everybody and you turn everybody into indentured servants. And people start to realize that it's a fault of the economic system that we are all becoming indentured servants and they react. And that is what they don't want. The reaction of the indentured servants, which we're all becoming, to stop it from occurring. All right, Eric Hayes says two thirds of U.S. small business owners fear that a, a continuation of President Joe Biden's economic policies will force them to shut down, according to a new first report by Daily Caller. The Job Creators Network Foundation found that 67% of small business owners are concerned that the present state of the economy may force them to close, a 10-point jump in 2022. Nearly half the respondents said higher prices and inflation would top concerns at 49%, followed by the overall economy. You know what they need to do? They need to learn some economy economics it you know so a poll says that these small businessmen which generally lean right for whatever reason i don't know they want lower taxes and 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 slave labor wages so of course they they, they want to say biden creates this biden didn't create inflation if they want to know what create inflation take a look at the people they're buying all those pri those products from at overpriced that's what they need to look at Sometimes, sometimes it's upsetting that people are so unread. It can be so upsetting sometimes that people are unread and have no desire to be read and no desire to actually do some critical thinking so that we can all make better choices. Sad, but so true. Michael Egberto, well, yeah, if you have government prior to, that prioritizes the needs of the people, there's no doubt such would be popular among people. And that's why, you know, right now, Biden is a gatekeeper, right? He's trying to hold back that flood of progressives. And he's one of the only ones who could do it. So he gave them a whole bunch, but not the store. We want the store, right? Because we understand that innovation comes from us. Expansion comes from us. Intellect comes from us. We understand that those billionaires are nothing but parasites. They create nothing. They don't have any inherent intellect. They move paper. We understand that. We understand that when they talk about the profit motive is necessary, why they have these exorbitant profits is to ensure innovation. How do you have that ensure innovation when that profit isn't going down to the actual innovators? I put a billionaire and a farmer on a, on a, on a deserted island. The person who will survive is that farmer who knows how to grow the food. And who know how to use the animals on, on, on that land? The billionaire will sit down there not having a clue what to do. Parasite. All right. Carl Cox says, with very few exceptions, the neoliberals believe, as Republicans do in crony capitalism, 100% right. Government of, for, and by the mega rich megs corporation is what they want. Yes, that's what they want. But anyhow, let's go ahead and get started. I have a very, very smart young woman that I would love, I would love be the one of the first female presidents of the United States. Of course, she has to wait about eight years or so before she qualifies. 
But it's just not great to know that we have people of this caliber, the caliber of this woman that's going to be there to lead us in the future. Check this out. We'll take it on the other side. She has a background in community organizing. In college, she was a student body president of the University of Houston, where she organized for DEI programs in the wake of the BLM movement. Many of those reforms have now been rolled back because of her fascist state legislature. Now she is organizing the TEA takeover and against anti-immigrant legislation like it's before. She firmly believes that the Democratic Party is the working people's party and wants the party to be more representative of the majority of people who make up the party. She says, we are younger, we're more left wing and exhausted by the political status quo. She decided to run for the State Democratic Executive Committee, the SDEC, to be able to make sure she is a more progressive voice in the party. And I will add to that a young voice, Jasmine Kadem. Did I say that right? Yes. I did I? Wow. Yes, Kadem is yes, it's Kadem Gonzalez, but yes. Okay. <laughs> okay, they only put Kadem. So it's Jasmine Kadem Gonzalez. Okay, got it. Yes. Así que hablas español? <laughs> sí. <laughs> oh, perfect. All right, great. Anyway, um first of all, tell me a little bit about yourself. So, um hi, I'm Jasmine. I am a lifelong Houstonian and I'm also a progressive community organizer. And let me let me see your community organizer. Whenever we say somebody is a community organizer, right, that has a whole lot of different connotation. Like, uh, are you just running around with the community, but are you doing something <laughs> substantive? And I know you're right. doing something substantive. So, you know, r- r- while the, the, the right and many of the neoliberals, even in the Democratic Party, sort of have a disdain for community organizers because they're really getting people power. Uh, what you're doing is, is that much more important. So tell me a little bit about what you've done. Gotcha. So um, I ran for um, student body president when I was in university. And at the time, I ran on trying to expand mentorship programs. Now we call that DEI, right? Diversity, equity, inclusion. Back then, right. they were just mentorship programs. And so at the time, we were talking about, well, how do we make these programs more accessible to students? How do we get them to know that these programs even exist? And then after SB 17 passed, um, all of those got rolled back. So the DEI centers were essentially shuttered. The LGBTQ center was also completely shut down. And none of these institutions fought back. In fact, what my university that would always say that it draws its strength from its diversity was one of the first universities to actually close these down in the state of Texas. And so we as students had to rely on our own grassroots organizing to then be in community with each other and be able to continue to have some of these mentorship programs kind of unofficially because we could not rely on these institutions to be on the front lines to fight for us. So we have always had to rely on ourselves and our own grassroots organizing. So they might, so the political establishment might have this disdain for this community organizing, but we don't have a choice but to do it because they aren't doing their jobs for us. Tell me a little bit about the law because you use the, the SV, I forgot what I said, uh, SV 17, you yes. actually use the law. Tell, tell the audience what it was all about And why is it that you had to come out and fight it so hard and do it on your own? Right. So SB 17 essentially got rid of all of our diversity, equity, and inclusion programs, um, really because of of racism. Um, That's really why. And because the GOP and the Republicans are using kind of race and critical race theory and all these things that they really don't understand as a way to kind of fear monger and, and collect um, support for their base. Um, but as, but these kind of legislations, they have a very real impact on, on people and on students. Um, and so in this case, we lost a long list of mentorship programs completely. You know, there was programs for, for black students, for Latino students, for LGBTQ students to be able to kind of like have more um, mentorship. You know, I didn't have a Latino like professor until I think I was a junior and I started and I minored in Mexican-American studies. 
That was the first time that I ever saw wow. somebody who was a Latina <laughs> who looks like my family members, who was in a position of, of, of you know, power and also was somebody who could be a mentor to me, who understood what it's like to be a working class person, you know, studying in university, because it was very similar to her own experience. And that was the first time I'd ever experienced that. And I had to major in Mexican Amer- or minor in Mexican American studies in order to even have access to that. And a lot of these programs are being cut by the school. And, you know, I'm not on the forefront of organizing, you know, against SB 17, but I am trying to be in community with other organizers to make sure that we still meet with these students who are still at university. I have graduated and make sure that they still have support and they know that we as, you know, outside community members, you know, we can try to be those mentors for them um, since the school isn't really letting that happen anymore. I consider you on the forefront of SB 17 because you're doing what the job that 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 the destruction of F, that SB 17 cause is actually doing. Where did you go to high school? Um, I went to Bel Air High School. So something about me is that my my parents, um, they're both immigrants. And mm-hmm. so we moved around a lot within the city of Houston. Um, my dad is a teacher. Uh, my mom worked as a custodian. And so we were, we were working class growing up. Um, but my parents, they always, I've never lived in a house. I've always lived in kind of like apartment complexes. And so because my dad was a teacher, he wanted me to go to, you know, these good schools. So we would move around to try to get, you know, mm-hmm. try to get me into to good schools. And, um, I think that's, it's kind of a shame that we have to do that. It kind of just speaks to the inequity that we have in our public education system. Where Even we within know one that, system. Within one system, right, within HISD, um, we know that those that folks who live in you know, poor zip codes, more working class zip codes, more black and brown zip codes are not going to get the same quality of education as those who might live in more wealthy zip codes. So we have this kind of divide between you know, working class people and the kinds of rights that they have access to and the kind of education that they have access to and, you know, wealthy people and the kinds of rights and um, resources that they have access to. Um, so I was lucky that my parents were able to do that. But of course, like, <laughs> like when you grow up working class, you realize you kind of get that class consciousness. Once you grow up, you're like, your friends are asking you, well, why aren't you buying anything at the Scholastic Book Fair? And you're like, well, because I don't have any money to spend on mm-hmm. you know, a bunch of, of books, um, which makes it even worse now that the TEA has taken over our school district. Um, they have shut down libraries mm-hmm. and, and fired librarians who... I mean, if we, if I can't go and afford, you know, going to Barnes and Noble and buying like all these, you know, nice books, I should at least be able to have that access in school libraries. And I was a kid who's frequented the school library all the time. And it's just a shame that these kids now in these, um, in these like taken over schools by the, by the state of Texas, that they're not going to have access to that. And I think anybody who says that they're on the forefront of education, who is shutting down schools or who is shutting down libraries, certainly doesn't know what they're talking about. Interestingly, you brought up a concept that I want to talk about. Um, But before that, uh, let's interspace this with what you're running for, first of all, uh, which is uh, the uh, SDEC chair. Tell me a little bit about that, and then we'll finish some more conversation thereafter. Yeah, so I am running for the State Democratic Executive Committee, or SDEC. Um, I want to be a more progressive voice in the Texas Democratic Party. And so what the SDEC does is that they're essentially the link between the state party and then local communities. So they control budget, they tailor messaging to communities, and they know when important legislation is being passed. And so they can tell the people on the ground. And, you know, I decided to run because I I do think that the Democratic Party is the working people's party. And I want the party to be more representative of the people who make it up, you know, what we want as progressives. And I guess like what that means, the difference between progressives like myself, and I think the majority of the people who should be making up the Democratic Party and the status quo is that we believe in human rights rather than privileges. So we believe that healthcare is a human right. You know, we believe that education is a human right. We believe that housing is a human right. I mean, we believe in the right to clean air and water. These aren't things that you earn, but you have a right to that you are entitled to just by being a person who lives in the US. And I think right now you see a very clear disconnect between the things that we want as as progressives and as young people, as working class people, and what the party status 
quo wants. And the problem with that is that if we want to fight back, as the Democratic Party does, against this rising tide of fascism in not only our city and our state, but across the country, then we have to make sure that the Democratic Party is the working people's party because we don't have another choice because we will lose that fight if we don't if we don't prepare for it, if we don't change the party and make it more progressive. One of the things that a lot of the older folks uh, don't get in the progressive movement, those of us that are older and progressive, we know it because we've been preaching this for decades. But um, a lot of times they hear all that you've just said and they think what you want is a whole, uh, you, you want to have a population of freeloaders. That isn't the case, is it? <laughs> no, not at all. I think, you know, there is this, weird misconception that if you give people like health care or if you give people like a living wage, um, then they're not going to work anymore, which is ridiculous because, you know, like more affluent folks, they have a lot, yet they're still working because it's not about people aren't going to just stop working once their basic needs are met. Like people want to continue to work because it gives them like a sense of you know satisfaction and fulfillment. For, exactly. And then they also, you know, some people might want to travel all over the world and work a little bit harder so they can afford to travel or so they can afford to even have a family. I mean, the, the Republicans like to always talk about how, you know, young people don't want to have children. Well, young people, I don't know if I'll ever afford a house to be, to be fair. My parents never afforded a house. I don't know if I'll ever be able to afford a house. I don't know if the rest of Gen Z is ever going to be able to afford a house, let alone like afford to have children. And so really, if they want to fix some of our problems, maybe it's time to start giving us, you know, paid vacation and paid sick leave so we can actually spend the time with our families. Right now, they just want us to work until we die, work for somebody else to get rich until we die. And I don't think that's a fulfilling life for us. And I don't think that that's a way that we can make our society, you know, a better one, a more equitable one. What I love about Gen Z is you're not scared to tell the truth. And um, it, it is it is amazing. You made one statement there that is the economic centralization of everything that I believe in. You work <laughs> for somebody else to make the profit. And then they say our economic system is based on the one who produces the more most, the one who innovates the most is the one uh, who profits the most. When in our economic system, that's not the case. 100%. I mean, we it, saw it in the pandemic, right? Yes. Who are the essential workers who our society relied on for it to function? It's folks that don't make a lot of money. And it's folks that, you know, it, it's folks that don't make a lot of money. Like that it was in they they are they are the people who are the backbone of our entire society. Without them, we couldn't function. We used to call them essential. And now we don't want to give them sick leave. We don't want to give them health care. We don't want to give them a living wage. And it's like, well, they showed up then and they will continue to show up now and show up better if we give people these just their basic needs to be able to survive. You don't know. I'm, I'm right now. You have me like, my God, this is a Gen Z person speaking. <laughs> what are, have you got to 25 yet? I'm, I'm 25. I just turned 25. You just turned 25. <laughs> the, the reason I asked that, the reason I asked that is the following. You don't know how much we need you out there with the Gen Z's and to put it bluntly, the younger millennials to really wake folks up and understand, first of all, that they have the power to do it if they decide to en enforce the power that they have. Gen Z plus millennial equal the largest voting bloc in this country if they choose to do so. If they choose to do so. And uh, having somebody like yourself out there pushing that button, I think will take us, and I'm not talking about old folks jumping into uh, the barrios or the, the ghettos or the are the wealthy places or whatever and trying to get these young people to vote. I mean, you guys getting out there and doing the work and say, hey, this is a reason that we are going to demand that those old farts out there do this. In other words, you right. can and demand we, it. I, I think, yeah. And the only way that we can really do that is if, you know, we organize around something that isn't just, you know, not like, oh, it's not the other guy. Like, it's not Trump. So mm -hmm. you have to vote. Like, that's... Obviously, that's an ineffective strategy. I think one organizing against fascism is really important. You know, right. I think that folks should be organizing against fascism. And I think that Trump poses a huge existential threat to our democracy. 100%. We've already seen it. 
you know? Um, but something else is like, if we want people to actually go out there and vote, just fighting against like this boogeyman isn't really enough. You have to actually run for something. You have to give us something. And, you know, we have a lot that we don't have right now. You know, Mm. we're, there's a lot that we don't have right now. Like we don't, we don't have healthcare. I think a lot of young people, they just, they literally just want some of their basic rights to be met. And we want to maybe even if we want to be a little bit more forward thinking, let's like change the relationship that we have with work. You know, let's have a four day work week. Like, I don't think that that's the most radical idea in the world. You know, I think some companies already do it, but of course it's going to be affluent um, folks who are, who have access to that, those kind of policies, right? They, they rely on, you know, these companies to give them, you know, unlimited PTO. But what about the rest of us? So we need our government to step in to give that right to the rest of us. So we can have that time to be, you know, with our families and with our friends. And, and so we can have more of a work-life balance rather than this grind that I think people are just exhausted with. The best ideas are coming out from our young people. And the reason why is they have no fear. They don't have no fear and they're not. Uh, and the indoctrination that most have been born with since the inception of this country has worn off. They've definitely worn off in your generation. And interestingly, when you talk about the four day work week, the three day, I'm in for three day work week because uh, there's this thing called artificial intelligence and robotics. Uh, these two, uh, these two things by themselves, uh, more than triple our productivity. And in doing so, if we were, if or if we had a five day work week and our productivity is triple, we can get the benefit from said productivity at the same time that we cut the work we can have. It's not all that much to ask. One, 100%. I, right. I'm right there with you. It's we shouldn't be using AI for to replace art. You know, no, like no, art no, no, should no, be no, for no, us. No. That should be no. for humans. Give no, no, us no. the time to be able to actually be creative and be artistic and, and give ourselves like a more, more purpose that isn't just, you know, grinding all the time. There is absolutely no disagreement there. In fact, all these things ought to be regulated to take the humanity into con- into into us. So there are certain things that requires no humanity. Art requires humanity. In fact, AI is the stealing. AI art is the stealing of the humanity of us all. Right? Because what AI does, the art forms when you do, they're it's picking and choosing, etc. There are forms of AI that actually is productive, it pro- increases productivity, and there's the other that can be not beneficial, but in the totality, it should re- reduce all of our work week to 100%, pre- you know, pretty much now. Um, so becoming the SDEC chair, do you have somebody that you're running against and how many people you're running against? So I don't really know because, um, people could kind of nominate themselves. It looks like kind of in person. Um, but there's going to be, um, two, two representatives for each congressional district. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that I've been the most active person who is, who is running, um, who, you know, identifies as a woman. So I think that I'm in a, in a good spot. Um, what district and unfortunately are you in? it's only people who are in the state convention who can vote. So right. I've been doing my phone banking, my due diligence to try to, um, persuade some votes my way. Well, let me tell you what we, we really need some fresh blood in, in the party. The party has been stagnant for too long. And as you mentioned, uh, the status quo is not, should no longer be tolerated. If we want to grow the party, what we have to do is bring new ideas. We need to bring new people into the, into the party and uh, holding on these positions as, uh, let me take my host hat off as a member of the party. I refuse to take on some of these positions because I think it is time for our Gen Z's and our Gen Y's, millennials, to take care of uh, these jobs. Now, I want you guys out there doing what needs to be done. So one of the last things I always ask, and it's, um, what would you have liked me to ask you that I didn't? <laughs> um, I think to end on maybe, you know, what should young people, what should young people do? You know, what should people do to get to get involved? And um, I think personally, I think everybody is an organizer. I think everybody should be an organizer. Um, I think that if you don't know what to do in your life, if you're having, you know, every every year we have a new crop of fresh grads who I know because I know this from experience are having an existential crisis about what they should do. Um, in their lives for the rest of their lives. At the same time, we have people who are who are aging, who are being a little bit more alienated in their lives, who are becoming a little bit lonelier. You know, other people in different stages of their lives. Maybe all their friends are having children, and they haven't, and so they feel lonely. Or even older folks, like I know um, seniors 
they have a loneliness epidemic as well. And I think that the best way to combat that, not only for the betterment of our society, but also for the benefit of ourselves and our own mental health, is by organizing and being in community with one another. I have the great opportunity to be organizing alongside people who have been doing this for way longer than I have. Some people have been doing this, like who are older than, than I am, have been doing this from since like before I was even born. And I have the opportunity to learn from them. And they are the ones who give me the confidence to even, you know, be out there and be an organizer and find my voice and, you know, not be super shy. And it's because of them that I'm able to really do this work. And so I rely on them very heavily. And I think that if all, if I think that everybody should try to be an organizer, find an organization. It doesn't have to be, you know, within a political party. It can be an organization that, you know, organizes you know, outside of, of party politics, but maybe is still politically inclined. I think everybody should join a political organization. Um, but even if it's not that, even just volunteering, finding something in your community that is wrong, and then finding other like-minded people who want to help solve it. I'm so lucky that I've been able to be in community with other people. And now, you know, I don't have an existential crisis anymore because I know it doesn't matter really what I do as a job because my purpose, my purpose is to try to better the society that we live in alongside all of my uh, fellow community members. And I think that's a very empowering thing for folks to, to do. So I encourage anybody, not just young people, but in any stage of your life to try to get involved and use, you know, your free time to to solve the problems around us. Jasmine Kadim Kadem Gonzalez. Uh, it's been my pleasure, folks. Uh, we need SDEC chairs like this. This is the kind of person that's going to revolutionize the party and put the party where it needs to be. It's been my pleasure to have you on Politics and Right. Thank you so much. I really appreciated this conversation. It's so nice talking to you. Now, is this young woman great or what? I want to clone this woman. I want to clone this young woman and just throw her out there to speak, to lead, and to do all of these things all at once. She knows the subject. She understands the humanity. She understands the economics. Da, that is, and, and, and has the presence of mind to put that out there. Is that great or what? Come on, man. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. Everybody asks me a lot of times why I'm so positive. Jasmine makes me positive. And the reason why she makes me positive is because I see what's coming up. But we got to make sure the pathway is left for her to get up on that path. Because if we screw up and get these thugs into office, if we screw up, and that allows these intellectually apt people to, to, to get up there. It's our fault. So I don't know, if, for any Democrat, by the way, this is going to be played live tomorrow on my KPFT show. So I'm going to be playing this one live uh, on air at KPFT 90.1 FM tomorrow. And I'll be writing the, blo the accompanying blog and... Substack and all that with, with, with her here. If you're going to, I don't know who's running an SD07. I don't know who is, but, uh, SD, I think it's, I think she's running for SDEC07. If I, if I saw the stuff right, but she would have me sold because like I said, we want young people. I look, if there's an older person, uh, running, maybe it is time for you to say, uh, you know what, um, Jasmine, you take it. I'll be there to help you. I'll be there to assist you. You can ping pong off of me. But I think it's time. It is time for a sea change. Get all the old farts, all of us out of there. Not out of there, be mentors. Because there's, there's, there's room for mentorship. Good mentorship, not overbearing mentorship. Mentorship that's just there to kind of, if somebody's steering a particular way, you nudge a bit, but they may nudge back and say, no, we need a change of direction and you're willing to step back. That's what we're talking about. All right. Our next subject is, uh, let me see if I have to answer any questions for Egberto. General from, this is from Michael Rudnin. 
Egberto, generative AI cannot be stopped. When you're talking about AI creating art as stealing from human work, that's not quite right, but it's remixing what humans have done and making multiple variations in a matter of minutes, not in a matter of milliseconds. You can also get an AI create original pieces and don't uh, copy from human work. There's AI are getting better and faster. How our civilization addresses this will be interesting discussion in the near future. But the idea of universal basic dividend where all the people get a percentage of the profits, I ask good. There's nothing you said there, my brother, uh, Michael, that is in conflict with what I just said. We noticed when I spoke to Jasmine, I said regulations and no, we want, we know that art is, and, and by the way, and the reason why I said it's no different is when you start to speak about the, the, the universal basic dividend, right? That makes it okay then for, let's say, let's say Jasmine became a great artist and she created a lot of work, titled a lot of work. And AI decided to, I go ahead and I make a query to AI. I want something that does X, Y, Z. And AI takes her work, somebody else's work, et cetera. If it's taggable, right? We can actually say, okay, this formation was there and that person contributed to the body of knowledge. And again, there are, AI is good that we can also create algorithms within AI that will compensate people appropriately. Now, when you say basic, universal basic dividend, what a lot of folks would say is, well, it can't be universal. It has to be based on work. Because, I mean, if you have somebody that puts a whole lot into the space and a lot of it is used in the space, yeah, they should probably be compensated more than the other that, that may not be adding a lot to the space. So there's a whole lot of things going here. Uh, let's see, Egberto, the sites I use for generating art do take minutes, not milliseconds, at least for now. Cryon.com. Yeah, I use AI for, uh, take a look at my blog for today. My blog today, the art form, I said, create, I told it to create an object. It was about capitalism and poverty, etc. And it created a representative sample made of, uh, you know, not human objects, but made of human looking objects and, and buildings, etc. So I use AI substantially in generating images for my blogs recently. So yeah, I get it. I really, really get it. Anyhow, let's continue to be busy. Uh, America, the, the most, the richest country in the world, purportedly the best healthcare in the world. Well, healthcare, if you have the best healthcare in the world, but most of your population cannot access it. And I don't dispute that we have the best healthcare in the world. And when I say best healthcare, it's not really, it's really likely the most advanced because there's a lot of investment. But I mean, if you go to Italy, if you go to France, if you go to UK, there's high technology occurring in these places as well. So let's not, you know, really, you know, jump on the bandwagon. There may be, because of our size, a lot more research that can take place over here because of size. Okay? So that said, why in God's name or in whomever you believe's name is our mortality, infant mortality rate greater than every other o OECD country? Even Cuba. Listen to me, folks. Even Cuba. In as much as they don't have the technology that we have, give their people better, consistent health care. Now, a Cuban would come to the United States, and when they are afforded health care in the United States, they would be in awe. Oh, wow, great technology, great stuff. Until they form a part of the system where they realize, but you go to the doctor, you can actually be bankrupt. You go to the doctor, maybe your entire check. All that sort of thing. But this one was striking when this article came out today. And let me get to the article. It says as follows. Insights into the U.S. maternal mortality crisis and international comparison. The United States continues to have the highest rate of maternal debts of any high income nation, despite a decline since the COVID-19 pandemic. And within the U.S., the rate is by far the highest for black women. Most of these deaths, over 80 percent, are likely preventable. With policies and systems in place, 
to support women during the perennial, uh, the prenatal period. Several high income countries report virtually no maternal debts. A policy as policymakers and healthcare delivery system leaders in the U.S. seek a way to end the nation's maternal mortality crisis. These countries may offer viable solutions. The brief update, uh, the brief updates an early Commonwealth Fund study of differences in, mater- in maternal mortality, maternal care workforce composition, and access to postpartum care and social perfections between the U.S. and other high-income countries, or which are Australia, Canada, France, Germany, the Netherlands, New Zealand, Norway, Sweden, Switzerland, and the United Kingdom. In this edition. We have also included data on Chile, Japan, and Korea, all high-income countries with universal healthcare systems. For our analysis, we use the most recent available data from the U.S., Centers for Disease Control, and from the Organization of Economic Corporations and Development, which is the OECD, of which the U.S. is a member, where country-specific data are more than five years old. We note whether more recent published data from other sources are available for that country. Readers should be aware that because the methods we use do derive updated numbers from other sources may be different from the methods of the OECD uses, data points may not necessarily be comparable to the U.S. rates. So after giving you all that errata, after giving you all that errata, here are the highlights and then uh, the link will be the link is in the blog for this show. But in 2022, there were approximately 22 maternal deaths for every 100,000 live births in the United States. Far above the rates for other high income countries, U.S. maternal mortality is lowest for Asian American women and highest for black women. Maternal death rates increase in Australia, Japan, the Netherlands and the U- U.S. during the height of the pandemic between 2020 and 2021. In Chile, Norway, and the U.S., uh, where 2022 data are available, maternal death rates have begun to decline. Nearly two of three maternal deaths in the U.S. occur during postpartum period, up to 42 days following birth. Compared to women in other countries we studied, U.S. women are the least likely to have supports such as home visits and guaranteed paid leave during the critical time. The U.S. and Canada have the lowest supply of midwives and OVGYNs. In the U.S., Canada, and Korea, OBGYNs outnumber midwives. Look, the answer is actually pretty simple. Get rid of the capitalist structure in healthcare. I mean, we don't have to overbear on these issues. If you have a profit motive that has nothing to do with health, why in the hell will a company spend the money necessary to make you healthy. I mean, they do a cost analysis. If you die, it may cost them a few million dollars if they are negligent. But they will make hundreds of millions of dollars for the current state of the system. So that's a business choice, not a human choice. When you put healthcare in the hands of the corporate structure, it will ultimately fail, and we are the country that does it to the max degree, and we have proven with the results. You fail. Medicare Advantage is a failure. Uh, private health care in America is a failure. Uh, it bankrupts people. It, it kills people. That is what we have. Now, if you are in that window of opportunity with a good healthcare plan with your corporation, great for you. But you know who you never see on TV? Our brothers and sisters in the ghettos, the barrios and Appalachia, who doesn't even go to the doctor because they know the healthcare system is not for them. And that comprises likely the majority of people. The majority of people that don't have, the majority of people that don't have Medicaid, and again, that is prevalent here in the United in, in the state of Texas, where our Republican politicians choose to kill its residents. Do you think that's uh, too harsh? Hell no. 
our Republican politicians murder Texans. Our Texas Republican legislature murders Texans. Why? Because they have neglected to accept the Medicare Advantage, the Medicaid, uh, uh, the Medicaid expansion to the Affordable Care Act, which would have given all their residents health care. And the state would have only been responsible for 10 percent of the bill. That is murder. That is categorically murder. And until we see that, these women that are dying out of mortality, the mortality rate for pregnant women, maternity mortality, murder. All of those people who create and continue to want the maintenance of our current healthcare system as it stands. That's murder. We have a murderous healthcare system. We have an unforgiven healthcare system. We have a healthcare system that bankrupts people. Uh, our guest today spoke about young people. They just want some health care. They want health care as a right. So, folks, let's be clear here. Let's understand the mortality, the maternity mortality that this article speaks about is no surprise. It is actually what we expect. So please vote appropriately in November. Vote like your life depends on it. You know why? Your life depends on it. Let's stop the decline. Let's completely stop the decline. And that's all that I have for today. Let me see if there's anything that I need to read out loud. Uh, Commonwealth Fund 2022, that's what, I, that's what I've been reading. So uh, let's see. The, the U.S. has the lowest life expectancy at birth, the highest death rates for avoidable or treatable conditions, the highest maternity maternal and infant mortality, and that is from 2022, and among the highest suicide rates. The U.S. has the highest rate of people with multiple chronic conditions and an obesity rate nearly twice that of the average OECD. Americans see physicians less than people in other countries and have among the lowest rate of practicing physicians and hospital beds per 100,000. And then we call ourselves the bastion of the world? Come on, folks. We have the money to do better. Better, We just have to stop the legalized theft. And the legalized theft is our economic system, a system built on parasites, a system that is designed by parasites for parasites. Remember, anytime you see that stock market trading and things moving, those are people that are doing very little for society. They are making a hell of a lot of money. They are causing the deaths of many companies. They survive. I mean, a lot of that's happening. Remember that. Anyway, that's it on our healthcare story for today. Uh, let me, let's go ahead and ask you to support the program now. How can you support the program? You can support our program by becoming a donor in many of different ways. One of the best way to do it is to visit us at politicsandright.com slash support, politicsandright.com slash support. That gives you all the different ways you can support us. But guess what, people? Guess what? Guess what? Guess what? You can also become a patron. And how do you become a patron? You go to politicsandright.com slash patron, politicsandright.com slash patron. And patron is spelled P-A-T-R-E-O-N. We still need a whole lot of patrons. We're very short on those. And of course, you can go ahead and become a paid subscriber of our newsletter. We have a lot of subscribers. Guess what we hit today? Today, we finally we have over 9,000 followers on our newsletter, the Egberto Off the Record newsletter. We finally got to our 100th subscriber, paid subscriber today. Not just subscriber, but paid subscriber. We need at least 900 more. It would be great if we could get. 900 more S quickly, quickly before we're completely dry. So please consider going to politicsandright.com slash newsletter, politicsandright.com slash newsletter. 
and click on that baby and become a subscriber. It's like saying to make our democracy move, to support the progressive agenda, to support us being able to get our stuff out there. I am going to make sure to support the politics and rights of the world. Let me show you something, guys. Check this out. Check that out. All right. M Michael has something for me to put on screen. It's over 9,000. <laughs> Ah, uh, Michael, 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 Michael. Let me go ahead and put it on the screen. Since, I mean, you, I know you like those guys. There we go. There it is on the screen, Michael. You happy now, brother? So, folks, um, if you want to see all the platforms that we address, go to politicsdoneright.com. Politics, go to politicsdoneright.com slash info. You see all the platforms that we end up on, all our stuff end up on, and you will be amazed because we make sure and permeate, propagate the progressive message in books and everywhere else. Books, articles, blogs, radio shows, both on air and online. We got to keep this stuff supported. So don't forget, go ahead and go to politicsandright.com slash newsletter. And please, Consider becoming a supporter by becoming a paid supporter of our newsletter. And guess what? You get to read all of my books for free. So far, five books and counting. So anyway, I got to get out of here. It's 402. My name is Egberto Willis. Uh, wait a minute. I forgot to thank our guest. Thank you, guest. That was a great guest. She was wonderful. Anyway, my name is Egberto Willis. This is Politics and Right. And you guys know how I end this, baby. I am what? Out. We spend a lot of time deconstructing the news, trying to, trying to parse it into a form that everybody can understand. We try to find those little nitpicks where uh, it goes, it flies above the fray, etc. If you really like these videos that we do, I want to ask a big favor. Please go ahead, number one, subscribe to our channel, and number two, please join if you can. Thank you so kindly for watching. Keep watching. Please remember to share. We must populate the entire internet with our progressive message, a message that we know is what most Americans say that they want. So help us please join.